So let's look at some techniques to deal with uh, outcome prediction for branches. And we're going to look at this mostly, first of all, in the static domain. So things that are not trying to watch the dynamic instruction sequence, but instead are can basically statically analyze the instruction sequence and uh, with some high probability, we'll say, try to predict location. <clears throat> the first technique is actually not a prediction at all. The first technique, we had talked about this a few lectures ago, or we actually we talked about this in lecture two, um, adding delay slots. So instead of, I don't know, having that time just be dead cycles when we're trying to resolve the branch, we, let's say we put a, uh, if we don't resolve the branch till here, we have, let's say, one delay slot, two delay slots, three delay slots, and we have uh, three instructions, we'll say. Or maybe you can redirect at this point out of X and you have two branch delay slots, depending on how you sort of wire that in, if you can make the cycle time. Let's say you have two branch delay slots. What ends up happening is you have instruction B, E, Q, Z here, let's say that is at address uh, 100. And then you have two instructions which execute no matter whether the branch is taken or not taken that follow it. So these instructions are in the uh, delay slots of the branch. And you know, you can have architectures which have things like load delay slots and other things like that, but for right now we'll talk about branches. <coughs> and we can force these instructions always to execute. Unfortunately, if you go look at the sort of percentages of probability you can actually fill these delay slots, it's pretty low. Um, it's, it's always not easy to find work to, to shove down here, because you're basically taking work that was above the branch and in the compiler reordering the code to put the uh, instructions that were before the branch after the branch. Hmm. Okay, well, this is good. I mean, if you could actually make this work out, this is, this is great. Um, one of the problems with this, though, is the probability of filling one branch delay slot, let's say, is 70%. And the probability of filling two branch delay slots is even lower than that. It's maybe 50-ish to 40-ish percent. As we said before, if you have a monkey pulling out of a, a hat or just some random process pulling out of a hat, you're going to do 50%. Correct. So. And as we'll see today, if you use some more fancy branch prediction or the outcome prediction uh, techniques, you can get the prediction accuracy of a branch all the way up into the sort of 95, 96, 97% uh, probability. And all the way, and people have built, if you look at your sort of uh, out of order super scaler, it's on your desktop, your core i7 these days from Intel, that's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 98 to 99% correct. So being able to fill these delay slots with some probability, um, which is less than 98%, is not a good, good, good trade-off. You would have better uh, been served possibly by uh, allowing some fancier prediction mechanism trying to fill it if you care about performance. Now, if you care about complexity or reducing complexity in area, a static prediction might be a good, good way to go. So let's, let's look at some um, basic rules of thumb here about static prediction. So the, the overall probability the branch is taken, let's say, out of something like specint is uh, 60 to 70%. But it's not equally distributed. Backwards branches have a much higher probability of being taken than forward branches. OK, so we got a question coming up here. Why is this? Yes, so, so loops with high probability, or by definition, to be a loop, you're going to have to jump backwards. If you jump forwards, it's pretty hard to loop. So if you jump backwards, it's a loop. And in fact, people like to execute loops, loops and stay in loops for a while, because that's where a lot of work is done. Um, so if you're seeing a loop, and you're just Spinning in this, this is increasing the probability that the backwards branch is taken, and that has a high probability. So that's this half. Forward branches, 50%. Hmm. OK. 
Can we, what's, what's going on there? Forward branch, 50% going forward. These are usually some sort of data dependent branches, like an if then else clause. So that's why the probability of this is much, much lower. Um, you sit in loops for long periods of time. Forward branches typically sort of uh, are if then else's and there's, uh, you're checking some data value and then you're either executing or not. <clears throat> now this gets a little trickier with some more advanced compiler techniques. Because um, sometimes with advanced compiler techniques, you will actually effectively convert a uh, loop with if then else into it or a, a condition check at the end into a unconditional backwards branch and then a little sort of branch that goes around the, the uh, piece of code which checks the loop sentinel or, or checks the, the whether the loop is completing or not. But even that's actually not a horrible thing because at least that backwards branch will always be predicted taken 100% because it just gets turned into a jump. So that's, that's not bad for performance, it's just, uh, you know, might change these percentages a little bit. But things do like to sit in loops, is what you should take away from this slide. Okay, so let's um, think about a technique to try to take advantage of this. So one technique that you can take advantage of this with is actually to add extra bits to your instruction set and allow the compiler to hint to the architecture whether the branch is taken or not taken. Now this is still a hint. If it gets it wrong, we still want the correct execution. So if it takes a branch, um, we, still want, we still want to go correct. Uh, uh, we still want to execute the right piece of code, but the performance might just be worse. So let's take a look at two branches here. We have branch.t and branch.nt. Branch.t is a branch which is taken, or predicted taken, and branch.nt is a uh, branch that's predicted not taken. Um, so what do I want to say about this? Well, architectures do have this. I was going to say the uh, Itanium architecture actually has static branch prediction completely. Um, some things have sort of intermediary things with this. Uh, for instance, the uh, uh, Motorola 68K kind of has something like this, but not, uh, uh, you can't do it with all branches. Um, so th this does exist in, in real architectures. And one of the, the things is that this can actually be very accurate, especially if you profile your code. Um, so if you run the code once and you allow the compiler to see which way the branch was taken, um, it can do quite good. And, and some of the insight here is there's a lot of branches in a program which are there just to check error cases. And the probability that they actually are taken or not taken one way or the other or something that can basically almost be statically determined at compile time. And in, definitely if you have feedback information of execution of the program once, that's, that's a, a very good indicator. So for instance, if you had a loop, you would, or the compiler would, uh, to note that the backwards branch is taken, so it would put a br.t, and if it's, let's say, some piece of code which just jumps over an error case and checks an error condition, and 99% of the time that uh, it never falls into that, it would predict, predict that taken, because it would just jump over that little piece of code. Um, so you can actually have very high prediction accuracy. Now we're not, we're not up into the 99 percent here yet or something like that. This isn't, this isn't great. We're still doing static things here. Um, and you know, at this point, it might actually make sense still to have uh, a delay slot because we're still not over our uh, 70th percent. We're, you know, we're, we're sort of a close trade-off here. You have to get the static prediction correct, and your delay slot uh, might actually still be a better approach at this, depending on sort of how, how this accuracy uh, compares up to how many times you can fill the delay slot. But let's take a look at what happens in the pipeline here. So here we have a branch taken, and it's predicted taken to this target. We still end up with a dead cycle here because we do not know where that target is until we've effectively decoded the instruction. So that in this sort of intermediate time here, we just have to fetch, let's say, the fall through case or something like that. But because we predicted it taken, 
we could, we could do better here. Um, we don't have to have two delay slots or two dead cycles. We can fill it. We can actually get the, the correct next instruction in here for the target. This branch not taken, let's say we speculatively execute the fall through. We, we don't actually have any uh, penalty for a correctly predicted branch here. So if we predict this branch not taken, that's the fall through case. We can just fetch PC plus four, PC plus eight, and just keep executing, and we have uh, no, no penalty there. Okay, so if we get the hint wrong, what are we going to do? Well, we've effectively taken a mispredict penalty here. And if you look at the branch taking case and you take a mispredict penalty, what's going to happen here is you're actually going to end up having two, two dead cycles because we don't actually determine whether we took the mispredict or not until this execute stage. And that's the, the soonest we can go redirect the front of the pipe. Now, if you look at this and squint really hard, you can see that we actually fetched op A twice here. This was the fall through instruction. It is hypothetically possible that you might be able to not hold off killing this instruction, if you will. And in this case, sort of have the pipe do something special and actually end up getting the instruction after op A or op B here, if you will. But that's pretty hard to do. So for the, for the base case, we'll just say that you end up with an extra cycle of mispredict penalty when you mispredict. Yeah, so just to reiterate that, what I was trying to say here is that with a branch taken, we fetch the subsequent instruction, the fall through case. We fetch the target of the branch. We try to kill this, but lo and behold, we actually end up fetching the exact same instruction again. So you could, if you really wanted to, try to optimize around that and not fetch this twice, but then you're kind of having things out of order in the pipe here because you'd have this instruction, this instruction's dead, and you have to figure out how to kill sort of sub-portions of your pipe or things out of order in your pipe, and that, that gets pretty, pretty hard to do. But this does really quite well if we do uh, static software-based branch prediction. Okay, so let's look at hardware branch prediction. Now, when we say hardware branch prediction, that does not necessarily mean dynamic hardware branch prediction. This could just mean that you have the hardware doing the prediction without any hints from the software. And we have a couple different cases we can try to implement, uh, heuristics, if you will, in hardware. The first one here, always predict not taken. This is what we've done so far in all of our pipelines that we've designed. We predict, we predict fall through effectively and we just fetch PC plus four. We didn't put a name on it, but this is actually what we were doing. We were doing speculative execution with a static hardware branch prediction of PC plus four. Um, it's pretty simple to implement. It's what you guys have done in your labs so far. Um, you know the fall through early. Accuracy is not very good. You get all your loops wrong. All your backward branches of your loops just are always predicted wrong. Okay, let's, let's do the inverse here. Predict taken. Let's have that be our static strategy in hardware. Well, kind of hard to do here because we don't really know the target of this branch in decode. So it's like going back to here. If we predict everything taken, what do we, what do we fetch in this cycle? Well, I don't know. It's a big question mark there. Um, it doesn't do super well on if then else's because a lot of times those are sort of forward branches over things, um, or or some depends on how you structure it. Um, some architectures which have things like these static prediction techniques will actually restructure their code such that the uh, compiler will figure out the probability of a branch being taken or not taken, and then work the code around it to make it work out. Um, that's actually pretty common. The, the Motorola 68K had something similar to that, and they, uh, the compilers there actually try to work around it. So, hmm, well, this is definitely a bummer here. Um, maybe we can fix that. Like we said, there is, this is the second part of today's lecture, is trying to fix this problem. Okay, how about uh, we use a heuristic that 
all backwards branches are taken, and the forward branches are not taken. Okay, so this does a lot better. This is our heuristic of what we were saying before, that loops and things like that will get uh, caught up in this. So a forward branch um, is not part of a loop. It'll, we'll predict that not taken. We'll predict the fall through. Backwards branch will predict taken. This does pretty good. Um, it's better accuracy. It's still nowhere near the sort of 80% accuracy that we had if the compiler could get involved. Because that's effectively a, the compiler case that we were talking about before could actually implement this entire algorithm um, in, in software. Or something much more sophisticated. And that's usually what ends up happening. 